Good morning, everyone. My name is Carter Keithley. I'm president of the Toy Industry Association, and I am really delighted to see all of you here. And thank you all for making the extra effort to be here despite the, uh, the inclement weather outside. It wouldn't be Toy Fair without a little snow and, uh, and weather. So here we are once again. Um, before we get started, I'd like to say a huge thank you to our sponsors this morning, Bureau Veritas, Intertech, TUV Rhineland and Underwriters Laboratories. We really, we have the highest regard for everything that you do and uh, the highest regard for your sponsorship also for this event. So thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the 2014 American International Toy Fair and the TIA, it really is my pleasure this morning to introduce our keynote speaker, Acting Chairman of the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, Bob Adler. Um, Chairman Adler has been actively involved in product safety issues for decades, stretching back to the 1970s when he was an attorney advisor for two separate CPSC commissioners, and his breadth of, breadth of knowledge in product safety goes beyond experience just at the CPSC. Prior to coming back to the CPSC as a commissioner in 2009, uh, Chairman Adler was a professor at le of legal studies at the University of North Carolina, and at UNC, he served as the Associate Dean of the MBA program and as Associate Dean for the school's Bachelor of Science in Business Administration, a recipient of teaching awards both within the business school and university-wide. His research and teaching focused on consumer protection, product liability, ethics, regulation, and negotiation. He knows the territory. He's, an, he's a tireless advocate for product safety, but uh, Chairman Adler has always been open to hearing the toy industry's concerns and needs and perspectives. He and his staff are continually willing to hear us, uh, uh, our perspectives, and to help develop solutions for the issues we face. He's a thoughtful leader with solid ideas for navigating the typically complicated world of product safety. Since coming to the agency in 2009, Chairman Adler and TIA have been close collaborators in our commitment to product safety. TIA has worked with him on seeking ways to reduce third-party testing costs, implementing new requirements for toys, understanding how the requirements impact business, and educating the industry on safety issues. The goal of keeping children safe while at play is shared by the toy industry in the U.S. and internationally as well. With safe toys being shipped to all corners of the globe, we, we strive to make sure children have safe and fun toys at their fingerprints, fingerprints, fingertips, and we look forward to, I said I could read a script as good as anybody else, but maybe not. Uh, we look forward to continuing our cooperation with Chairman Adler, and it is a personal pleasure for me to introduce Chairman Adler to you this morning. Bob? Uh, good morning, everyone, and Carter, thank you for that incredibly kind uh, and unjustified introduction. Uh, and I uh, have my own problems reading scripts, so forgive me if I stumble every now and then. Uh, it is really terrific to be at the Toy Fair again. I came into New York yesterday, and no surprise, I was extremely, extraordinarily impressed at the creativity and variety of new toys that I saw. I'm also impressed at how organized this enormous fair is each year, and Carter, that's got to be a credit to you and your wonderful staff at TIA and to all the companies that have worked so hard to set up their booths. I'm looking forward today to walking the halls of the Javits Center and meeting with inventors and small businesses and green businesses. These are all companies that find inspiration in the joy that kids get from safely playing with their toys. And as I walk around the convention center, I can clearly see why this is the industry event of the year. I would remit, be remiss if I didn't acknowledge my wonderful colleague, Anne-Marie Burkle, who is here today. Uh, I've really, really enjoyed serving uh, on the commission with Anne-Marie. We do disagree occasionally. And I must note that she's a Syracuse fan, and I'm a UNC Tar Heels fan. 
but we still get along. Uh, mainly, I should note that my favorite team typically is whoever's playing Duke at the moment. Uh, and therefore, I was actually rooting for Syracuse a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so I hope you will all uh, pay great attention to her remarks. She is just truly a wonderful colleague. And I've got to acknowledge a few other people. My Deputy Chief of Staff, Jana Fong Swamidas, and Commissioner Burkle's Special Assistant, Nancy Lowry, are also here at the table right here. And uh, may I ask CPSC staff who are here if you would raise your hands, please. Okay. Now you will see the CPSC staff walking around looking at booths. They will be going undercover, cleverly disguised as CPSC staff. Um, and when you look at the number of staff that are here, you have to understand that we are an incredibly tiny agency. So this doesn't mean we shut down the agency, but it comes close, which means this is an enormous investment of resources that we dedicate to Toy Fair. And we do that because we think it's so important. Uh, and we're doing it more than just checking out the latest toys for our family. We want to learn. And we also want to educate. We want to learn what's new with toys to see if there are any unforeseen hazards that we can foresee. And we want to make sure everybody understands what our legislation is like, especially the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act and the various laws that we enforce. And I totally agree with what Carter said. We all share this commitment to making safe and compliant toys. What I'm about to do is to share a statistic with you that always makes me nervous when I share it. So I'm going to try to qualify it as much as I can, but it's at least interesting to note. If you look at the last fiscal year, we announced only 31 consumer level toy recalls, none of which involved lead violations. Now, that fact standing alone to me doesn't tell you very much. In fact, we still find excess levels of lead on toys that come into the ports where we catch them at the ports. So nobody's saying we're not finding products with excess levels of lead. But here's where I think the story does get interesting. We pretty much approach compliance in a steady state, uh, depending on the need of the moment. So this drop in the number of consumer level recalls, I am assured, means fewer serious violations, not reduced inspections, and not any inattention by CPSC staff. So that at least feels like we're headed in the right direction. And here's another happy point, both for you and for us. Last season, no toy scare, which means no media frenzy, which means we could all go about doing our business. So we've gone from 172 toy recalls in fiscal year 2008 to 31 last year. Don't read too much into that. And we went from 19 toy recalls due to excessive lead in 2008 to none last year. That doesn't mean, as I say, there weren't uh, levels of lead. And here's another statistic, and I'm going to qualify this as well. Deaths associated with toys also appear to be on the wane. Now, why do I say appear to be? Because there's always a huge time lag between when a fatality occurs and when we record it officially and announce it for the year. So right now, we're running pretty much on 2010, 2011 data. But informally, the data seem to be very suggestive that toy deaths are on the wane, which is fabulous, and of course. We still have issues, uh, and I think you all know that. Uh, manufacturers, importers, and distributors are, we're asking to still remain vigilant in addressing choking, ingestion hazards, chemical and magnetic dangers. These are the types of hazards that lead to recalls, and we had recalls last year. Uh, one of the things Carter did mention is that it's been 40 years since I first came to the Consumer Product Safety Commission. I've kind of followed it over the years when I wasn't, even when I wasn't working there. And I've seen uh, relations between CPSC and industries wax and wane. But what seems to me to be the case is that the degree of partnership and the level of cooperation and good feelings and trust between the CPSC and the toy industry have been on the increase. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen it at a higher and better level. So we thank you for this great trajectory. And I also have to say, speaking about my agency, we've gone through some highs and we've definitely gone through some lows. Uh, and I think these days it's fair to say we are 
uh, on an upward trajectory, and I can't tell you what a thrill that is for me to announce. And I think it's fair to say that Congress has recognized the good job that the agency's been doing. They recently appropriated, and I need a drum roll, $118 billion. Now think about that. That is a drop in the bucket in terms of uh, federal agency budgets. But for us, it was great news because it's a march upward. But please understand, that's a rounding error, and if even that, for most agencies. And I was always also struck by the fact that a couple of years ago, FDA proudly announced that they had add, added X number of field staff. And I looked at that and I said, that's more than we have staff at the Consumer Product Safety Commission. So anyway, um, I wanted to talk about three major areas where we think we've made progress and we want to continue. The first is our effort to explore ways to reduce testing costs while still assuring compliance with safety requirements. I want to talk about expanding our presence and effectiveness at U.S. ports. And then I want to talk about some topics that are not necessarily of direct interest to the toy industry, but they're of major interest to the CPSC. And I'll just briefly mention some of these other topics to let you know we don't just look at toys. We actually have other responsibilities. Before I do that, though, you have to forgive me. Professor for 22 years, I'm going to wax philosophical on a point that sometimes bothers people, and I at least want to respond to that. And that is, I often hear the argument that when it comes to regulating children's products and other products, that the child, the parent, the caregiver deserves more blame for the injury, the accident, than the product. Uh, I don't like the term blame, but I understand the concern, and I'm sympathetic up to a point where child or parental misuse, rather than a direct product hazard, is the cause of an injury, I think we should look at options other than regulation. But here's my problem. I don't think the world often, sometimes it is, but often is that black and white. When you think about it, if there's an accident, if there's an injury, it typically involves at least three major inputs, the consumer, the environment, and the product. And that's where it gets murky. Because typically, when you have an injury or an incident, it involves the interaction of those three factors. And at times, you can't really point to one as the cause. And I think Congress understood that when they wrote our legislation back in aught 72. They went out of their way to extend our authority to risks even where consumer misuse plays a role. Or let me put it more bluntly, if consumers always acted responsibly and reasonably, most of our safety standards would not be necessary. Uh, unfortunately, they, consumers, we, consumers, don't always act reasonably. I think we all know that. If people didn't leave prescription medicines where children could access them, if homeowners didn't stick their hands under the casing of their lawnmowers, which happens to the tune years ago of about 70,000 lost digits a year, uh, if children didn't improperly play with matches or get too close to burning stoves in loose pajamas, there would be much, much less need for CPSC safety standards. The problem is that we see consumer misuse, it's predictable, it's foreseeable. And Congress, when they wrote our legislation, said, we want you to protect consumers even where consumer misuse occurs as long as it does not unreasonably, I see my friend Rick Locker smiling because he knows the punchline is coming, as long as the regulation doesn't unreasonably affect the product's utility, cost, or availability. And as more and more research emerges on how hardwired uh, we are to act unreasonably at times, I go back to a line that's not original with me, but I think really does capture an insight. It's easier to redesign a product than it is to redesign a person. And would that it were be would be different. And it's not that I'm saying you can never redesign consumers. Some of the education campaigns that we've done do work, but it takes a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of patience. That's why we put so much energy into working with you on the toy standard, F963. And that's why we're always seeking to have more compliance with F963. I really do think that F963 is one of the best toy standards in the world. Think about it. It's created toys with encapsulated magnets, shortened pull cords, fewer small parts, and a move away from the use of toxic metals. Now I want to come back to the point I was making previously. 
Sometimes there are behaviors by kids that lead to injuries that are not really related to the way a product is designed, nor to any reasonably foreseeable misuse that anyone would want to protect against. So my favorite example, eight-year-old Timmy says, I want to whack my friend Tom on the head with a baseball bat. I don't think most of us would say, my God, we've got to redesign baseball bats. And I don't think we would want to take away somebody's uh, jack-in-the-box from the market simply because Mary hit her younger sister in the face with the jack-in-the-box. Um, these are the sorts of uh, incidents and injuries that call for approaches, if anything could be effective, that don't have to do with regulation. So we have this estimate of 192,000 toy-related emergency room visits every year for kids younger than 15. And obviously, we remain concerned about this, but you have to put some of this into context and understand some of this has more to do with the Timmies and the Susies than it has to do with serious product defects. So this is where the challenge for all of us arises. We need to, as an agency, approach regulation with a measure of caution and prudence, balance and nuance, and I think we do that. Uh, when we talk about these data, these statistics in public, I think we do acknowledge that sometimes some toy injuries don't have much to do with unreasonable product design. Uh, and I want to commend particularly our communications staff, Scott Wolfson, Nick, Nikki Fleming, who is sitting at the table down here, for being incredibly thoughtful, fair, measured in the way they give out information. We're also trying to be as fair in carrying out the requirements for third-party testing, which is, is an obligation imposed on the agency by Congress to impose upon you. So that's why I keep saying we're in this together and we have to be partners. The independent testing requirements for children's products were considered to be the capstone of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, and I will say my uh, special assistant, Jana Fong Swamidas, was one of those on the Hill who was helping to write the legislation, which is one of the reasons I hired her, because anytime I see something I don't understand, I can always say, Jana, you wrote it, what does it mean? I do think that helped restore confidence in the market. If you remember in 2007, the year of the recalls, there really was a measurable degree of consumer panic, and I think the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act helped deal with that. Uh, and I think that's generally, on balance, a good step, but we also understand that the cost of third-party testing has really put a strain on a number of companies. Uh, if you've met Neil Cohen, our small business ombudsman, he is well aware of that. He is constantly working with members of the industry to try to lessen the burdens of third-party testing. And we have a piece of legislation that was passed in 2011 to try to ameliorate some of the concerns that companies had with third-party testing burdens. Uh, and that was Public Law 112.28, which we take very seriously. We have this week a vote of the commission that I am hopeful, Commissioner Burkle's here, she can tell you how she plans to vote, to set up a workshop on April 3rd, please note the date, for addressing ways to reduce third-party testing costs. We want to explore these ways, we want to talk to you, and we particularly want to talk about this notion of determinations that are designed to help reduce cost while ensuring compliance. Let me tell you what I mean when I say determinations. We've done this before with respect to lead, and we're hoping to do it again with respect to other products. Uh, and that would be a commission decision, a determination that a particular material or product does not contain and will not contain a violative level of things like lead and phthalates, and therefore does not require third-party testing. That's the cleanest, simplest way. That's the thing that most of the folks in the industry tell us would be the greatest step in terms of reducing regulatory burdens. So this workshop is in keeping with the public law, one 1228, and the goal is to provide our staff and therefore the commission with information and evidence concerning possible determinations that certain materials, as I said, irrespective of their manufacturing origin or process, comply with the applicable content or solubility limits of our safety standards. So we're looking for information and evidence that will enable us to make 
a finding consistent with the law, which is a, quote, high degree of assurance that the children's product safety rules will still be complied with without the necessity for third-party testing. So we're seeking information about raw material sourcing, the manufacturing processes used, whether recycled materials are or may be included, and the potential, which is always a worrisome thing, of contamination in the manufacturing process. As many of you know, last year we put out requests for information, what we call RFIs, on ways to reduce regulatory burdens, and this workshop is the next step, uh, and we think it's an important step. And we think it's a particularly important step, and why the reason I'm dwelling on it here is because TIA typically, historically, has stepped forward with incredibly useful information for us to help make these determinations. So we look forward to talking to you about phthalates, lead, and the use of the eight uh, metals and chemicals in the toy standard. So after the vote, if it passes, we will put the meeting notice in the Federal Register. We'll open up a registration process on our website, and we hope that a lot of you will attend and speak. I want to talk next about our import surveillance program. I think, as many of you know, we are trying our best in doing what I think is a great job, being proactive in stopping dangerous products at the ports. Uh, we work hand in hand with the staff at Customs and Border Protection at the ports, and we're all striving to be more proactive. Uh, now, there is this little issue of funding and resources when it comes to running the import program. Congress uh, set up a program that we know affectionately as RAM, which stands for Risk Assessment Methodology. And the focus of the RAM is on early detection and targeting of high-risk products and repeat offenders. Uh, we've had the pilot RAM program, the project, underway as a result of Congress telling us to do that. We think it's a good idea. We hope to expand it. And the way we hope to expand that is to get some additional resources and some additional funding. So stop and think about this. $20 billion worth of toys are imported each year. And the nice thing about that, the good news is that a high percentage of these, as far as we can tell, are compliant. And there's some bad news. During the past five years, CPSE and CBP have stopped nearly 10 million units of about 3,000 different toys that violated applicable standards. That's why I was saying we're still finding lead violations. So the types of violations, lead paint, lead content, phthalates, small parts. These continue to be the most common violations. And it's fair to say also that a lot of the smaller companies, I'm sure some of whom are here today, are continuing to have issues with what accompanied the third party testing requirements, that is, certificates of compliance and tracking labels. There are some bad actors. Now, we know none of them belong to TIA, but there are still some bad actors and there are still violations, and we're going to continue to be vigilant in working to stop this. Uh, on a more helpful note, we cannot thank you enough for your association's assistance to us in helping to educate everybody within the association, and particularly the smaller members, uh, about our rules. And we certainly ask your help in continuing that. But if we're going to expand the RAM, if we're going to uh, do more inspections, then that's where we need some more resources. Uh, you get ready for another statistic. 21 people at the commission work at select ports. So there you go, 21 people against the world. Uh, now, we do enlist other staff as needed, but it's still a drop in the ocean. You can't fight a fair fight. You can't fight a good fight, which I think is in your interest, those of you who produce compliant products, to screen $700 billion of consumer product imports, not just toys, but consumer products annually, about 340 million of which come from China. So let me just give you a little bit of context. Our presence at the port represents about 0.05% of the number of FDA inspectors located at ports around the country. And yet, I would argue we have a mandate that's every bit as broad as FDA's. Does this sound like whining? Please, I'm trying not to whine, but I do get a little frustrated. But I think it's fair to say the more eyes we have on incoming shipments and potentially violative shipments, the safer American consumers will be. And for you, 
the compliant folks, the more level the playing field. And we think that's in your interest. We think it's in everyone's interest. That's why we want to call it a win-win-win for the commission, the trade, and consumers. Now I'm going to switch topics, if I might, and I promise I'll be brief. But I did want to talk about some other issues that uh, are of concern to those of us at the commission. And let me start with uh, a major concern for me, and that is me. Uh, that is to say, folks like me, uh, a nice way of saying it is senior citizens. Uh, a, not, a better way of saying it is those of us who have hit geezerdom. Um, but let me just give you some statistics about seniors. We're the fastest growing demographic in the country. Right now, we are 13% of the population. By 2030, we will be 20% of the population. We have more people in this country age 65 and older than Canada has people. That's telling you about our demographic. And here's a very serious concern. We constitute 13% of the population. You want to know what percent of fatalities from consumer products we constitute? 60%. 13% of the population, 60% of fatalities from consumer products. So you can see why I am urging the Commission to pay more attention to seniors. I hope in the not too distant future we'll dedicate the same energy and concern to protecting the elderly that we now dedicate to protecting kids. We're never going to give up protecting kids, I assure you. But I do hope we can at least add some emphasis for those of us in the geezer category. Uh, and I think if you stop and ponder, for the seniors, sometimes we present the same issues of helplessness and vulnerability that kids do. So I really urge all of us to pay more attention to this exploding demographic. Another topic quickly to mention, look at the weather out there. No surprise that I personally and people at the agency stress out about another product uh, in greater use and unfortunately associated with incredibly tragic news. Think of the weather reports of ice storms, snowstorms, and hurricanes. And then I instantly flash to the deaths that are caused by CO poisoning from generators. Um, and what bothers me is when I see a major storm coming, and I had trouble sleeping during Sandy, which didn't hit us, because I said, people are going to die. They're going to survive the storm, and then they're going to die because they don't know how to use a portable gas generator. After Katrina, 22 people died from carbon monoxide poisoning. After Sandy, 17 people died after Sandy. And the returns are not yet in, in the aftermath of winter storm PAX. Carbon monoxide is an invisible killer, and people don't understand how dangerous it is to run a generator. You could drive, and I hear various estimates, but a half a dozen cars and park them in your garage with the engines running, and that would still probably be not putting off as much CO as just one portable generator in your garage. And people don't understand that just moving them outside but still close to the house where there's ventilation that's taking it into the house can be every bit as fatal. And we try, oh, how we try to educate people about this incredible invisible killer. But here's a statistic. Between 1999 and 2012, to our knowledge, 800 CO deaths from generators. So in December, I went to Chicago to uh, join in a program with Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, the Chicago Fire Department, and the National Electrical Manufacturers Association to talk about this hazard. You want to hear bad timing? Our event occurred just hours after massive headlines in Chicago and some headlines across the country. Twelve people in Skokie, Illinois, rushed to the hospital due to exposure to CO. Uh, so I think when I mention this, you could understand why I'm so concerned about this. And so the quick message for you all is 95% of the people in the United States claim uh, they have at least one working smoke alarm. It's probably lower than that. But the similar statistics for CO alarms, and they're now so much cheaper, 42%. That's a huge discrepancy. So look to your own homes, if you would, please. And we're not just talking about warning folks. We'd like to see the industry make uh, the generators safer. And we think it's possible to do that. We've been working with folks at the University of Alabama 
And NIST, you all know NIST, National Institute for Standards and Technology, formerly NBS as I knew it, to do some work in developing the technology for things that work in other arenas. We know they work and we want them to add them to the CO, uh, excuse me, the generators. And that's just fuel injection uh, systems coupled with catalytic converters, a well-known technology that would dramatically increase the escape time for f folks if it were incorporated. So we're working with underwriters laboratories. Again, UL, thank you for sponsoring this morning's event uh, to make greater safety happen. And we have some other priority items that I will just mention in passing if you have any questions, if we have time for them. We do have a change in our voluntary recall rules. Uh, I note in passing, vigorously opposed by my colleague, Commissioner Burkle. And we're working on uh, a rule that has to do with information disclosure. It's section 1101 in our rules. We affectionately call it 6B. We just had a vote last week to modify it to a small extent. I think Commissioner Burkle and I had what I thought was a very thoughtful and spirited discussion of this regulation. Uh, we did vote to proceed uh, to update the rules. Commissioner Burkle vigorously dissenting on portions of the vote, and uh, I thought she did a terrific job in arguing for her perspective. At any rate, from the Toy Fair to ICFASO to our headquarters in Bethesda, your industry, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, I can't think of any industry that we have had a better partnership and working relationship over the years, and a lot of it goes to folks like Carter, but also the staff uh, from TIA, uh, Ed, Autumn, Rebecca, my good friend Rick Locker, all of you folks have been so helpful to us in working to develop a great relationship. I'm just gonna make one quick uh, observation. If you look at home appliances, uh, refrigerators, stoves, things of that sort. Do you want to know how many safety standards the Commission has written for those products because they can uh, burn you, they can gas you, they can e explode on you? We have a grand total of zero safety standards with one exception, refrigerator doors to keep kids from climbing in, closing the door and suffocating. Now contrast that to the number of standards for toys. It isn't that we're lax in enforcing with respect to home appliances, but it is the case that societal concerns for kids for toys is so great that every year, I think without exception, some new regulation standard descends upon your industry. It's something we live with, it's something you live with, but years ago, I think we decided to work together as partners, and I think it's made for an incredibly harmonious relationship, but even more importantly, it's made for extraordinary safety in the marketplace, and we can't thank you enough for working so closely with us. So in closing, Carter, thank you again for the wonderful, wonderful contribution you've made to us, and thank you all for coming out to hear me on a snowy morning. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ed Desmond. I'm the Executive Vice President of External Affairs at TIA. And let me just add my thanks to Bob and to the staff that he's recognized. Also, Ray Aragon from the CPSC, who will be on the program a little bit later. Um, Nancy with Commissioner Burkle. I think it's your first toy fair. And Nikki, we found out yesterday in talking, this is your 18th toy fair. So in a couple years, we'll have to think of some special 20th anniversary prize for Nikki. But to all the other CPSC staff, I know we have some folks uh, from Customs and Border Patrol here as well. Uh, thank you for taking the time to come up here and, uh, and visit Toy Fair and meet with some of our member companies. And just before I do introduce our next featured speaker, you know, in Washington, there's a lot of policymakers we meet with. And the, the standard is not whether we find one we agree with all the time. There are none. What you really want is someone will let you be heard so that we can go in, represent the industry, and be heard. Hopefully you, you convince them of your position and you represent the industry, um, but at least you're heard and you can bring in members with you and talk. And both Bob, who has never turned us down to speak at one of our fly-ins or to meet with members when they're in town or to come to Toy Fair, and the same with Commissioner Burkle in her brief time there, that's what you're looking for and that's what makes these particular policymakers um, very, very effective at what they do. So Bob, thank you again and uh, we really appreciate that. So as many of you know, um, two new commissioners were sworn in uh, last summer at the CPSC. We hope to have both here 
um, at their inaugural toy fairs, but unfortunately, uh, Commissioner Robinson was not able to be with us. But we are delighted uh, that Commissioner Anne Marie Burkle is here, and again, along with her staff, uh, longtime staff member Nancy, hopefully you'll have a chance over the course of the afternoon uh, to meet with them if you didn't run into them yesterday. Um, Commissioner Burkle was officially sworn in last July, and as you, if you look at her bio and look at her background and experience, there's probably no one more suited to take over a commissioner uh, position at the CPSC. Uh, she's a registered nurse, getting her nursing degree in 1972. She's a lawyer, having gotten her law degree in 1994. She's a former member of Congress, having been elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 2011. But perhaps more than that, she's a mother of six grown children and a grandmother to 15. So if that's not experience with toys, I don't know what is, and gives her just the kind of experience she needs to deal with a lot of these issues. Um, while in Congress, representing uh, the upstate New York area of Rochester, Commissioner Burkle focused on a number of domestic and international issues. And with her nursing and medical background, one of her priorities was looking at health issues impacting um, our, our uh, veterans. Um, she was also appointed by President Obama to serve as a United States representative to the 66th session of the General Assembly of the United Nations. We've had, TIA staff has had a number of opportunities to meet with Commissioner Burkle and with Nancy. Um, um, and also, Commissioner Burkle was gracious enough last uh, September to speak to a number of you if you attended our fly-in in Washington, D.C. Um, we've seen firsthand in just her six or eight months at the commission how quickly she learns about an issue and really throws herself into it. Um, sometimes contacting us for information uh, if we haven't already provided it and really wanting to learn and hear from all sides uh, of an issue. We appreciate that she's given TIA that kind of time to share the views of the toy industry on many important matters and we are pleased that she is, is here with us today. So please join me in a Toy Fair welcome. Hopefully this is the first of many trips uh, up to New York to Toy Fair uh, by the new commissioner, Anne-Marie Burkle. Thanks so much. Good morning, and thank you, Ed, for that very kind introduction. I feel like I've been the one appointed to do the rebuttal to our acting chair. <laughs> Not really. Um, I'm delighted to be here. This is a wonderful opportunity for me to get to meet all of you and um, the folks that I haven't met in my very short six months at the commission. Uh, this is not my first toy fair. I had a friend who was in the dollar store business many years ago, and he would bring me along because I was the consummate consumer. And so we would shop toy fair for all of his stores. So it's good to be back here, and I'm constantly reminded while I'm out on the floor of the dedication and the hard work of the people who, who run those booths. And so I'll talk about that a little bit later. I, I have a very short period of time, and so really what I want to do is introduce myself to you and make sure that when I leave this podium, you understand and you know that there is an open door at CPSC, just as Acting Ch uh, Chairman Adler's office is, with my office. And whether it's voluntary recall, that period of that comment period is over or 6B, or determinations, or harmonization, please, please engage with us. Please let us know your thoughts. Please let us know how those proposed rules affect your day-to-day -day ability to do business. It's, I feel, in this new role, that we have a moral obligation to pass regulations that make sense, that make products safer for our kids, and nobody cares about that more than I do, but pass regulations that are efficient and effective. That's what good government is. We have, to, we have to partner, and that's why I want to encourage all of you today to feel like you have a partner, that we can work, that we can find solutions to these problems, and that we can create safer products, but not at the risk of the American dream. And, and if you look at my background, I really am the American dream. Uh, what I came from, I went to a very small Catholic high school in Auburn, New York, and I believe me, when I went into the guidance counselor's office, and I was thinking of that this morning, she was also the typing instructor, and it was, she was a nun, and she, back then, and I, I'm a geezer too, I must admit, <laughs> um, when you went in and you, you talked to your guidance counselor, your choices as a woman were secretary, nurse, teacher, 
homemaker, or you could be a nun. That was always the first, the first idea they threw out at you. No, one's, no, no one mentioned the word Congress. No one mentioned the word commissioner. Those just were outside of, of my reality growing up. But because of hard work and ideas and a fire in my belly, I got to, to achieve, really, the American dream. And everyone in this room had had that fire in their belly. Yesterday, we toured the floor. We had a marvelous day, and I do. I want to thank Joan and Rick and Ed and Autumn um, and all of the people who took us through. Rebecca was just so wonderful. Because when we went to booth to booth to booth, we didn't meet buildings. We didn't meet industries or businesses. We met people. We met people who are committed to creating safe products. We met people who were in education and wanted to educate kids. We met people who started businesses in their garage. And that's, that's the American dream. That's what this country is all about. Working hard, picking yourself up when you fail, and working harder to achieve success. And, and as a government agency, we don't want to interfere with that dream. We want to be your partners. We want to help you do better. And at the end of the day, we work together to, become, to create and to have safe products out on the market. That's what this partnership should be about. There isn't a person in this room who doesn't want safe products. And, and you know, when I came to CPSC, you know how it is when you start a new, uh, a new project or a new job. You're always surprised at the things that you never even thought about, and then they happen. The first thing that happened, I got to CPSC, and I was incredibly impressed with the staff at CPSC. As Bob mentioned, it, we are a small agency, and we have people there who are so committed to being a fact, a database-driven agency, and an agency that puts out good information. So I was just so impressed with our staff there. And the other thing that impressed me tremendously, beyond what I have ever conceived, was the fact that the people who are out there manufacturing, importing, creating these products want safe products too. They want to comply with these regulations. And so that's why it's so important for us to create regulations and promulgate regulations that make sense, that affect safety, that create safe products, but at the same time they don't hamstring string our businesses and they don't make more work, and they just make sense. And that's sometimes where government kind of loses its way. We have to make sense. Bob used the word reasonableness. That's the kind of standard we want to create, ones that are reasonable, that make sense, that ultimately get us to that safe product. So I'm delighted to be here today. I think I've used up my time. Probably hear a gong soon. Um, I do want to, again, make sure you all understand we have an open door and we want to hear from you. The 6B uh, proposed rule, we just voted on that, as Bob mentioned. Please, let us hear from you. Let us hear from you about determinations once that um, we get that into the Federal Register. Let us hear from you. We want to let you know that you have partners in CPSC and we, we look forward to working with you. And as we enjoy this time together this morning, if I could, ask all of you to keep in your thoughts and prayers the men and women of the military. Um, as was mentioned by Ed, I served on the Veteran Affairs Committee, and I was chairwoman of the subcommittee on health. And so I got to see up close and personal the tremendous sacrifice the men and women of the military make. And so as we're here today enjoying this opportunity to be together, let's keep in our thoughts and prayers those people who serve this nation. And I know in this audience today, we have veterans. and so. We thank you for your service as well. This is a great nation. It is because of the service and the sacrifice of the men and women in the military. So thank you all very much. Great to see you all. And uh, we're going to do a little more touring today. But I just have so enjoyed my time here. And I thank you all very much. Thank you, Commissioner Burkle. Um, I, I'm Joan Lawrence. I am Vice President of Standards and Regulatory Affairs for Toy Industry Association. I do want to thank Commissioner Burkle. To reiterate Ed's introduction of her this morning, she is eager to hear from industry, from the products and the industries that the CPSC oversees. And both she and Acting Chairman have always been open and willing to hear from these industries. Um, she also mentioned that they are soliciting comments 
um, on a couple of issues that are outstanding. If you, you are welcome to, and invited to solicit, uh, to submit comments as a company. If you are uncomfortable submitting comments under your company's name, you are welcome to provide your comments to TIA. TIA is also filing comments on behalf of the industry, and you can contribute to those if you prefer. Um, but I, again, I do want to thank Commissioner Burkle and to Acting Chairman Adler for being with us today. It's my pleasure now to introduce Ray Aragon. He is the Director of Compliance for CPSC. He joined CPSC in 2013 and serves as its Director of the Office of Compliance and Field Operations. He manages the CPSC staff responsible for investigating and recalling potentially hazardous products and enforcing mandatory product safety standards. Ray regularly briefs the Commission on compliance and acti enforcement activities, and Ray and the, the compliance staff identify the need for mandatory and voluntary product safety standards and work with industry to improve product safety. Before joining CPSC, he was a litigation partner with the Washington, D.C. firm McKenna, Long & Aldridge, specializing in product liability litigation and liability management issues, with a special emphasis on pharmaceutical product liability and safety. He has a degree in economics from the University of Maryland and is a graduate of, law of Yale Law School. So please join me this morning in welcoming Ray Aragon. Great. Good morning, everyone. Joan, thank you for that great introduction. And uh, I'd like to start by joining Chairman Adler and Commissioner Burkle and extending my thanks to TIA for putting on a, a really good show. The staff has been wonderful, and uh, the, the, the flow of information um, has been great. So I really want to thank TIA for that. Um, I also want to thank the uh, CPSC compliance and field staff that are here today uh, who will be walking around and meeting with some of you. Uh, we actually have a booth. Uh, I know I'm not supposed to advertise, but 2501, the booth will, booth will be staffed today uh, by some of our uh, experts in child products, and they can provide information. Uh, in fact, we're handing out a flyer that uh, I was reading, I thought was extremely good, and uh, they'll be walking around and talking to some of you. I ask you, please, to engage with them. Um, they are experts, and they know about these areas extremely well. They know a lot about toys, they know a lot about children's products. And what they're here for today is to share some of that expertise and to share some of that knowledge. I hope you'll, you'll, you'll talk with them, and I hope that you'll listen um, to, the, to the comments that they have. Uh, as the director of the CPSC's uh, compliance and field operations, I'm really glad to have the opportunity to meet myself with so many engaged members of the community that's regulated by CPSC. Uh, TIA's members are engaged in an area that's of particular interest to the Commission and the compliance staff, and I want to take my time to talk with you uh, about how we can work together to make toys and children's products safer for our children. As I start that, though, I want to make a comment and point out, pull out a couple words that uh, Chairman Adler and Commissioner Burkle used in addressing you. The word cooperation. Cooperation came up again and again and again. Chairman Burke will just use the word partnership. These are not big law enforcement terms that come up. We, uh, we have a law enforcement function, but historically we have dealt with that function and we have dealt with these responsibilities by cooperating with the industry, by providing information to the industry, by negotiating with the industry, and I think the impact has been enormous. So I hope people appreciate that, and I hope that when they deal with CPSC, they'll continue to have um, an open mind. Now, having said that, I think as a speaker, uh, since we don't know each other, uh, you know, we should have a little contract about what we're going to talk about, and it isn't often that someone would start a speech by saying, I'm not really going to say stuff that you don't already know. Um, now, so why would you even listen? Well, I think that you should listen because we're talking about product safety. That's something that's important to you, and it's something that's important to us. And when problems arise, whether they be recalls or regulatory violations that require that a product be removed from the stream of commerce, we don't often look back. And by we, I mean the manufacturer, the importer, 
the industry and CPSC, we don't always look back and see what, and try to say, gee, you know, what happened here? But when we do look back, it's surprising sometimes what you see. When a shipment gets turned away at a port, um, one of the primary reasons, and it happens all the time, there are no child product certificate. Now, why is that? And the answer quite often is there's no system in place with the RET manufacturer, the importer, to make sure that that happened. Likewise, when there's testing certifications that are missing, that happens on a, on a daily basis. When there are tracking labels missing, it isn't because someone conspired to break the law. It isn't because someone said, gee, it's too much work to do a tracking label. It's because the manufacturer, the importer, simply didn't have systems in place to make sure that these things happen. So entire shipments of products, which might otherwise have been perfectly fine, are refused entry into the U.S. with significant delays and significant costs. The same is true for lead violations and phthalate violations. This happens hundreds of times a year. Um, we, we, when, when a crib fails, when a toy has small parts that can come off, when a mattress doesn't fit a crib, and there's a gap there that presents a real safety issue to a sleeping child, you can look at it. Any of us could look at it. You could look at it and say, you know what? No one really thought about safety here in a comprehensive way. If they'd have done that, that wouldn't have happened. This mattress would fit. This small part would not come loose. And so I want to encourage everyone at TIA, all of its members, to take a look at those issues and think about safety in a more integral way. Um, and I mention this not because CPSC is looking for business, okay? You're the business people. You run businesses. You run successful businesses, and you know how to do it. We're in the business of promoting safety, and we think that the way to do it is to have safety built into every product from design to manufacture to importation and on to distribution. We want to work with you to make sure safety is an integral part of every toy and child product sold in the United States. Now, how can we do that? Well, the answer isn't necessarily obvious, but I look, as I just mentioned, at where we have problems. And in the last several years, we've stopped thousands of shipments of toys at ports. We've removed millions of toys of, uh, from, from sale for several obvious reasons. And I asked the compliance staff, our in-house experts, what are the most obvious steps that a regulated party can take to comply with all CPSC regulations and make sure toy products are safe? And I got the answers back loud and clear. There are three main issues that I I'd like to address with you today. One is testing. The second is certifications. The third is record keeping. Oddly enough, if you look on our website under cpsc.gov slash testing, you'll find information on testing. And if you look on our website under cpsc.gov uh, certifications, you'll find that. And you'll also find an, uh, an FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions, about record keeping that lists step by step everything that has to be done. Of course, these three things don't paint the entire picture. There are defect issues. We'll talk about that for a minute. These issues arise from poor design, sometimes poor construction, sometimes quality control. They're very important cases, and we will talk about them. But when asked directly the question, what can a toy manufacturer or importer do to ensure that its products are safe and avoid, products, uh, avoid problems in manufacturing and importing the products, I have clear answers. Testing, certification, and record keeping. And I should mention, when I asked our uh, director of regulated products what I should talk about, she said, testing, testing, testing and certification, certification, certification. That's why I'm telling you, you know these issues, but I want to stress them with you and I want to underline them. Now, we'll talk about these issues one at a time. Um, a slide, please. Thank you, Amber. I start with our mission. This is our mission. Protecting the public through unre against unreasonable risks of injury from consumer products through education, safety standards activities, regulation, and enforcement. I think that that's all wholly consistent with the comments that the chairman made, with the comments Commissioner Burkle made about cooperating and partnering with industry. We really want to do that. In the case of toys, we uh, f pursue our mission largely through setting and enforcing regulations on toys. Um, next slide, please. So what are toys? Well, there's a summary. And by the way, I want to recommend again and again our website 
uh, which has very good information and references to our regulations and even the, uh, the, the, our, our laws um, that provide better information on these subjects. But anyway, to CPSC, a toy is a consumer product designed or intended by the manufacturer for, uh, for a child 12 years of age or younger for use by the child when the child plays. A child care article means, and this is a quote, a consumer product designed or intended by the manufacturer to, facil to facilitate sleep or the feeding of children aged three years and younger, or to help such children with sucking or teething. Now, there are key requirements that apply to these products. And they're, first, they're subject to lead limits. Uh, accessible components have a uh, limit of 100 parts per million of lead, somewhat lower level, 90 parts per million for paint and surface coatings. Banned phthalates, which are listed in some detail here, uh, also have a similar limit at 100 parts per million. And uh, you can see the information. There are permanent ban on three of them that are listed here and an interim ban on uh, toys that fit in the mouth or uh, for child care articles. Another very important requirement, and once again, you know all this, is ASTM F963, uh, particularly 11. Uh, you should all be aware of that and knowledgeable about them. So these are the products that your standards have to meet. But how do you prove compliance? Uh, well, let's talk about that. Next slide, please. You need third-party testing by a CPSC-accepted lab, children's product certificates issued by the importer or manufacturer, track and tracking labels for the products. These, all this information must be made available uh, not only to the retailer, but also to CPSC and U.S. Customs on Demand. And if they can't be provided, or if our standards, bans, or regulations are violated, the result can be product detention or destruction or uh, recalls or even civil penalties. Um, nobody wants that. And, as I'm trying the, and one of the things I'm trying to make is these are all easily avoidable um, issues. Uh, next slide, please. That five, yeah. Um, so for the testing of children's products, um, I want to stop here again and revisit the theme. Importers and manufacturers must make sure their products meet all safety and regulatory requirements. Um, now, it's true to say there are others in the chain, perhaps your contract manufacturer, perhaps others, who should do it. They will do it if you contract with them and if you check with them, but it's your responsibility. So remember uh, that this is something that you have to do. It's every bit as important as designing a good product. And the costs of not complying are many times greater than the cost of complying. In addition to the safety issues, which we all want to deal with, you face products being withheld at ports, possibly uh, refused entry into the United States. That causes costs, hassles, delays, which nobody wants. Um, the potential of enhanced surveillance for future shipments, once again, result in hassles, costs, delays, and nobody wants that. And then even in the case of uh, serious violations, potential recalls and withdrawal of products. Now, these are important business issues. Why? Because not because uh, it's just a product doing business. Nobody wants that. And in most cases, uh, the issues can be avoided with paying attention. So uh, I, I think these are important issues, and that's why I keep raising them again and again. So I want to quickly summarize the testing and certifications that are needed for the product. Slide, please. Uh, first, you have to identify, uh, and this is initial certificate testing, you have to figure out what the nature of the product is. What is its class? Is it for younger children? Is it for over eights? Uh, is it something that can be mouthed or teeth? The requirements differ. Uh, you also have to consider the intended audience or the user who would reasonably use the product. I mention this because it's a specific issue and sometimes something we need to talk about. You can't categorize out of a safety requirement by picking a product uh, use age that is more convenient to you. It has to be practical and it has to make sense. And uh, for example, if there are choking hazards. If a three-year-old child will, uh, is going to play with it, you have a, that, that's an issue. It has to be addressed. And it, you can't address by saying, uh, for eight and up. Um, you know that, but sometimes uh, people need to be reminded of that. Now the material and the composition, wood, metal, painted product, can it be mouthed by a small child? Are there batteries involved? Are there cell batteries? Can the issue be swallowed? So um, these are all issues that have to be considered. Um, and slide, please. Now, as far as the testing goes, and there's good information on our website and in our regs about the necessary testing. But third-party testing is required for children's products. Uh, you need CPSC. Uh, accepted lab to do it, and based on the passing results of testing, the importer or manufacturer completes uh, 
a children's product certificate. And that certificate lists, it in, lists certain information, the product, the, the, the citations to each applicable rule involved, identification of the importer, manufacturer, certifying results, um, contact information for further information, date and place of manufacturer, date and place of the test, um, identification of all third parties who provided information, that sort of thing. Um, but, it, the, the, but the key point is not the details, which you can look up. The key point is those documents are necessary to place a product in the stream of commerce. And if you look at it, it can be easily done. Why they end up missing a couple hundred times a year, I'm um, hard to say. But after you go home and think about it and talk with your experts and talk with your importers and freight forwarders and everything, I think we can all be sure that it's never going to happen again. So please think about it. Um, next slide, please. Uh, can you rely on um, one? Is that eight and one back, please? Yeah. Um, yeah, component part testing. Um, one issue is whether a manufacturer can, comply on a, can rely on a supplier's component parts testing results. The answer is yes, uh, provided you exercise due care in relying on a component part certificate or test results. Okay, uh, slide nine, please. And the, uh, the, what, what, is, what does due care mean? Well, it means you have to be careful. It means you have to inquire about tests, inquire about procedures, confirm that test results are from a CPSC accepted lab. Uh, that the results make sense. You have to review the results. Um, and that's a quality control issue that's important, particularly if you work with a lot of uh, CPSC accepted labs. Um, but maintain records of your due care. One issue that comes up, and we see this again and again, when, even when the documents aren't missing, sometimes the, pro the, the documents necessary to show that everything was done correctly are hard to come by. And that creates delays. It creates a lot of problems. And I know that keeping good records is a, is a burden for a small company. I know it takes time. I know it takes effort. Um, but I think over time, you'll find that it's worth it. Um, next slide, please. If there's a material change in a children's product, it has to be retested. And that's a contextual thing. It has to be contested. If there's a new part, uh, integral part, that has to be tested. If there's a new way it's manufactured, um, that has to be tested. If there are important new parts, if there are important new procedures in manufacturing, new fasteners is one issue that comes up. Um, those things have to be retested. And sometimes we see, and if, if you look at recalls we've announced, you'll see that a change in a product to manufacture a new strut, a new support, um, it wasn't tested. And then in the future, the product fails, and then there's a, there's a recall. Once again, easy to, easy to foresee and it's easy to fix. And in retrospect, when a problem comes up, you can see what happened and say, OK, we're not going to let that happen again. Um, next slide. Periodic retesting also is important. If you have continued production, you have to retest to ensure that your children's product continues to apply uh, with appropriate product safety rules. And uh, you'll see, and this is the next slide, that periodic testing must be conducted depending on how you're set up at one, two, or three-year intervals uh, based on the nature of your, of your, of your testing plan. Um, and then one issue that I mentioned twice and I'll mention once again is record keeping, which is on the next slide. For five years, um, yeah, for five years you have to maintain your children's product certificates, your third party certification results, um, descriptions of material changes in design, processing, sourcing, test values, et cetera, and records of, of periodic test plans based on your, on, uh, on your, on your retesting practices. But the best practice is this. Just maintain documents of all actions that provide you, your customers, and CPSC assurance that your products comply with a applicable product safety rules. Um, sometimes they do, and the regulated party can't prove it. That takes time. Um, that sometimes things are held up in the ports for a couple weeks while documents are gathered. Once again, nobody wants that, and it's easy to deal with. Um, next slide, please. Now, I was talking about regulated products, and in children's, uh, in toys and children's products, that's, that's crucial. Small parts, lead, phthalates, um, uh, parts that can be malleable, those are crucial issues, but not all violations are, re are, are regulatory. Um, regulated parties need to identify and report patterns of defects in design, engineering, quality, labeling that amount to what we call a substantial product 
uh, hazard. And items to consider are the severity and likelihood of potential injury, vulnerability of the affected population, uh, the number of units uh, potentially affected. So even a product that meets all regulations if in practice it shows that it creates a substantial product safety hazard, it is subject to CPSC compliance action. Uh, I know you know that, uh, but I state it because once again, I look back, if you look at recalls on regulated products that end up being what we call Section 15 or, or defects issues, you would often look back and say, how did this happen? If I had walked around this product and looked at it, I would have seen that. I would know that. Um, meet all the regulations or not, sometimes you can look back and say that simply was not a product that was say, as safe um, as, it, as it needed to be. Uh, and if that happens, and if you see that there's a regulatory issue or even a record keeping issue, you have to report. Next slide, please. You have to report immediately if you're aware of substantial product safety hazards, safety hazards, or regulatory violations. Uh, and it's important that you report immediately. If you're in doubt, you should report immediately. And if you have a question, you should also report immediately. This is something that comes up. When someone contacts CPSC, you're not giving anything away. You're not saying, I violate, well, if you have a lead violation and you know it, you can say we have a lead violation and we know it. But if there's a safety issue that comes up, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a recall. It doesn't even necessarily mean that there's going to be a compliance action. One statistic, this isn't so focused on children's products, but in our fast track program where people come to us and say, we think we found a defect in a product and we want you to look at it. There's a substantial percentage, more than 20 percent, where we look at it and there's no recall necessary. Okay, but in that conversation, there's a lot of useful information that we can share, a lot of useful information for the regulated party. And by the way, they've relieved themselves of an important legal obligation, uh, which is to report. What you don't want to be is in a situation where, in retrospect, you should have reported and you fail to do that. If you're in doubt, report. If you have a question, report. If it's a close call, you should report. Because I think it all comes out in a, cooper in, in a cooperative way uh, with CPSC, we can review the information with you. Um, you would be surprised at the number of calls that our compliance staff gets in the course of a week from some, someone saying, gee, I'm concerned about this issue. Gee, I just found this test result. Gee, I'm looking at this crib or this toy or this button uh, on a doll or this eye on a, on a mannequin. I'm looking at this and I want to I talk about it. Um, so if you have doubts, if you have questions, please report um, and, and do so immediately. Don't, don't, let, don't let time pass. Uh, all reports, even if they don't result in a recall, result in useful data. Now, next slide, please. Getting back to how, uh, what our strategy is, uh, as the chairman pointed out, we need to target our efforts. We work with global regulators and manufacturers to make sure that products that come into the United States, which is an enormous amount of toys, um, comply with all appropriate standards. Um, we work with Customs and Border Protection to enforce safety standards, and in fact, we have our own Office of uh, Import Surveillance. In fact, Jack McDaniel of uh, our Office of Import Surveillance is going to speak later on this morning on our work with uh, CBP and our uh, Commercial Targeting and Analysis Center, CTAC, that allows us to identify uh, products that we think are most likely to have issues. And by the way, this harkens back to something that I mentioned. If there are a lot of regulatory violations, certificate violations, lead violations, that does make an importer more likely to be reviewed in the future. Again, nobody wants that. You want to run a business. We want you to run a business. So attention to these small issues will have a, a, a very large um, payoff. Uh, but one of the points that Jack McDaniel is going to make, and I'll make it too, is that frequent areas of concern are product certifications, test certifications, test data, tracking labels. And when we find these shipments, we detain them. Sometimes they're destroyed. Uh, sometimes the manufacturer importer is targeted in the future. And in retrospect, so many of the problems are easily avoidable. So next slide, please. So to summarize, we want to provide information to regulated parties. We want to cooperate with regulated parties. Commissioner Burkle, uh, use the word partnership. 
We want to work with regulated parties. And we don't want, and you don't want, to be involved in, co in unnecessary compliance issues. The best way to avoid that is extra care, soup to nuts, comply with uh, consensus standards and regulations, sp seek products with uh, careful third-party certifications, be wary or be thoughtful, is the real word, of material or component substitutions, um, conduct spot inspections. And overall, think about these issues on an ongoing basis, not, okay, does it pass CPSC standards? Look at your products. This is a part of product stewardship. As you look at, whether, does this have a good design? Is this going to be attractive to, attractive to children? Or is this going to be attractive to parents who buy this stuff for their children? You also want to ask, is this something that's safe? In use, is it going to make sense? Is it going to cause a risk um, to children? And if you think about that, the compliance issues you're going to have are really going to fall away. Um, next slide, please. So uh, even when testing and certification is not mandated in every circumstance, you need to make sure that your products meet all requirements. Uh, I think it says there, test early and often. It's pretty good advice. Uh, I hope that you will. Um, because the, the cost of testing is a small fraction of the cost associated with a recall or a regulatory violation. Uh, what nobody wants to see is containers uh, being detained at ports and eventually uh, destroyed. Um, nobody wants that. Well, from a business standpoint, it's uh, from a regulatory standpoint, it means that we had to remove something uh, from the stream of commerce. From a business standpoint, it means that products you were, your, your customers were relying on aren't coming in, hurt your businesses, hurt your reliability. There's an easy way to avoid that. Uh, we have some uh, resources that I want to commend to you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, starting with the Handbook for Manufacturing Safer Consumer Products. Um, it's a good source, and if you look on our website, uh, I'll confess it's not the best organized website, but there's a wealth of really good information on complying with these standards. Um, please use it, and as you put together compliance programs, as you work with people on product stewardship issues to address compliance issues, I hope that you'll use the CPSC website as a good guide. Um, it's, it's a very good guide. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, here are some more resources to stay in touch with, with what we're doing. Uh, please visit our website. Please monitor activities. Uh, please look at saferproducts.gov. And please look at our recalled products. Because when you look at them, again, there's a negative lesson. Uh, for you, it can be a very positive lesson. When you run into a very expensive recall, you can look at the product and say, here's how I can avoid that. Here's why this is never going to happen to my company. Here's why my customers are never going to have to wait three months for something that I promised them. Um, you can learn expensive lessons very cheap. And I hope that you'll do that. And I hope that you'll continue uh, cooperating with, with CPSC. And Amber, if you go to the last slide, please. So I hope that. Um, there, yeah. I hope that, well, I think I've kept my promise of raising only issues that you already know about. And I hope as well that I've encouraged you to think about these issues in a more business-like, in a more holistic way. Because uh, if I've succeeded in that, you'll now consider safety of children's products a fundamental part of toy design, manufacture, import, and sale. Uh, that will be good for consumers, which is great. And it will be good for your businesses, which is great and it will be good for TIA and this entire industry. So I hope you'll think about it, and I certainly wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you to Ray Aragon. Um, that's the first time Ray's been with us since he just started at the agency last year, so we were so pleased to have him and, and hear from uh, CPSC Compliance and Enforcement. I'm just going to make another um, Brief plug for our sponsors today. We want to recognize them and thank them and also let you all know that there's a little bit of coffee and, and uh, caffeine in the back for those of you who need a little plug as we move forward. The next topic we're going to hit is the port, we're calling it the port report. Um, it's, we're going to hear about the joint initiative between Customs and Border Protection and CPSC at the ports and the impact that it's having on toys. So for this topic, we're pleased to have both agencies represented, and it's my privilege to introduce the two speakers who will be covering this topic. And while I can't see them, I'm uh, great. Thank you. They're standing in the wings. 
Um, first, we have Ed Ryan, Supervisory International Trade Specialist from the U.S. Uh, Customs and Border Protection. Ed is the Acting Assistant Director for Enforcement at the Consumer Product and Mass Merchandising Center of Excellence and Expertise. I'm not sure what the acronym is, but I'm dying to know. Since 2010, Ed has been serving Customs and Border Protection in Washington to oversee the Commercial Targeting and Analysis Center, CTAC, a multi-agency fusion center for agencies to address import safety risks. Prior to this position, Ed served with CBP's Commercial Targeting Division with responsibilities over trade fraud and anti-dumping duty evasion. Prior to CP CBP, Ed worked on foreign investment programs for U.S. Senator John D. Rockefeller in West Virginia. Ed holds a bachelor's degree in international relations and history and a master's degree in international commerce and policy. So he's going to be one of our speakers right now. We also have Jack McDaniel. Jack is International Trade Specialist with Consumer Product Safety Commission, CPSC. Since 2010, he's been serving as an analyst addressing import safety, safety risk at the Commercial Targeting and Analysis Center, CTAC, in Washington. He began serving the federal government as an officer with CBP in San Francisco, where he worked at length in processing inbound cargo with the Contraband Enforcement Team, Cargo Document Analysis Unit, and Trade Inspections Branch. He began working with CPSC after owning and operating a small international business in Miami and later worked as a code enforcement officer at Miami International Airport. So we are thrilled to have these two here to talk about the partnership between CBP and CPSC. And so please join me in welcoming our next two speakers, Ed and Jack. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I can tell from walking around that you're a you're a visual group, uh, uh, so before we dive into some monotonous slides, uh, I thought we could uh, kick off with a video that I think really helps to encapsulate the partnership uh, that, we're, uh, that we've maintained with the Consumer Product Safety Commission, but also with TIA in your industry. Uh, so without further ado, maybe we could cue up the video. P-H-T-H-A-L-A-T-E, that's what they call a phthalate. Uh, they were uh, flagged at the ports uh, for po possibly having uh, phthalate content in the doll heads. It's a banned uh, element in the substance in toys. It's basically a plasticizer. It makes things soft and pliable, somewhat similar to the If it is intended for children, it has to meet the strictest federal safety requirements here in the United States. We were able to accomplish 10 seizures of unsafe toys at eight of our port of entries. And CBP and CPSC work together to seize hundreds of thousands of dolls that contain phthalates. In case we have a banned phthalate, uh, which is nicknamed DEHP. Uh, this is one of our targeted phthalates, uh, so this is uh, in violation of the law. Well, they're regular sized dolls that, you know, any parent would purchase off the shelf for their little girl. This is an optimum time for parents to also think of safety of the toys they're buying and safety of the products, you know, toys that I'm purchasing and giving to my daughter at Christmas. I wanted to have that confidence that these toys were safe. We want to continue working as we have with government agencies, medical professionals, consumer organizations, and other experts so that we're continually making sure that we know everything we can in order to make toys as safe as possible. In my capacity, I want to help ensure that for other consumers, other parents out there. And by working together, we kept children safe in this instance. That's why it's so important that we have a partnership with CBP, a partnership where we can use each other's resources to target uh, cargo that may contain violative products identify those products early, pull them over when they come into port, inspect the containers, and stop dangerous products from getting on store shelves. Uh, protect uh, American consumers from unreasonable risk and harm. Uh, helps me sleep at night, helps them sleep uh, better at night. It's a win for CBP, it's a win for CTAC, it's a win for the CPSC, and it ultimately it's a win for the consumer. So I think it's a win. 
think we heard that. Um, so today's comments, we're going to focus around one particular aspect of what CPSC is doing now in relationship with CBP understanding. It's a multifaceted approach, as we heard from Ray, um, understanding that we're seeing new emphasis of CPSC at our ports of entry, understanding that requires a partnership. Hence, the need for Jack and I to both be up here at the same time um, talking. So today's comments are going to focus around one aspect of that relationship, which is the Commercial Targeting and Analysis Center. Uh, so with that, we'll dive right into the slides. Um, CTAC is a response. So things had to happen in order to need a commercial targeting and analysis center where you're bringing in regulatory authorities such as CPSC uh, and other agencies, which we'll learn about here in a few minutes, um, alongside Customs and Border Protection for the sole purpose of looking at advanced data regarding importations of products that fall under their jurisdictional authority. Um, what we saw several years back was a reoccurring theme of import safety incidents is occurring and U.S. government not having a single response to those instances, right? And what we found in the common theme was it was all about information sharing. When could we share that information? Um, so today we're going to learn about our response to that. As Customs and Border Protection, uh, we bear responsibility as the executive agent at the border to help facilitate the movement of trade. We also help to ensure the laws of over 50 federal agencies at the border, which, be, which can become quite complex. Um, next slide. So here's who we have at the Commercial Targeting and Analysis Center today. Uh, we have eight federal agencies. Uh, it's important to note that the first federal agency to join the Commercial Targeting and Analysis Center in April of 2010 was the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Um, so they've been with us from the beginning. Um, what a federal agency gets when they join the CTAC, um, they get a seat uh, alongside me uh, at downtown Washington, D.C. in a discrete office building off of L Street. Um, they get CBP systems um, at their fingertips. They have the ability to see that advanced cargo data that they lacked prior. Um, we are looking at other federal agencies coming on board, understanding we have two USDA agencies now, two Department of Transportation agencies, um, CPSC, and our criminal investigative arm, ICE. Um, very much helping to support criminally investigated, investigative leads for these various regulatory authorities. Uh, I'd also like to uh, thank the uh, Toy Industry Association for having uh, a member of the Import Surveillance, uh, Office of Import Surveillance with CPSC uh, here to address uh, you folks today. Um, as you may know, there were many, many challenges uh, put before us that were sparked by the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act back in 2008. And one of those requirements, as was already mentioned by uh, Acting Chair Chairman Adler and Mr. Aragon, uh, was the development of a risk assessment methodology, otherwise known as the RAM. And uh, of course, this was for the purpose of helping us address import safety uh, at the border. And uh, because of these uh, uh, requirements, of course, it's been um, necessary for us to um, make some changes and transform the way we do business. This is especially so since uh, uh, part of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act uh, uh, introduced uh, new requirements that imposed uh, uh, cooperation, uh, an increased level of cooperation between CPSC and CBP. So obviously it meant a transform transformation of the way that we do business um, with each other as agencies. Uh, so, I'm here to offer uh, a perspective from uh, the participating government agency, the CTAC, with CBP, who are our partners now, and uh, hopefully we can offer some helpful information to you um, about how CTAC is taking these changes head on. Wonderful. Um, so these are the agencies that we have on the roster. Um, we are in negotiations with uh, three additional agencies, um, FDA, Fish and Wildlife Services, and National Marine Fisheries Services. Uh, essentially what a federal agency is signing up to do uh, when they join the SeaTac is to place uh, co-located uh, employees with us within a CBP space in downtown Washington, D.C. for the purpose of addressing their regulatory risk at import. Next slide, please. 
Um, it's important to note that CBP is a, is a pretty massive organization. Um, when Border Patrol and U.S. Customs joined together after 9-11, uh, what we saw was one of the largest federal agencies uh, stand up under the Department of Homeland Security. Um, what you have listed here uh, are the various offices within CBP that are helping to support the regulatory mission at the SeaTac. Next slide. Okay, so um, hopefully we should be kind of caught up on um, why U.S. government established uh, a commercial targeting and analysis center, um, who we are composed of uh, from a regulatory sense. Um, now we kind of want to get into the nuts and bolts of how Jack and I do our day-to-day -day grind uh, at 1400 L Street, downtown Washington, D.C. at the SeaTac. Um, these are the six steps that we do to mitigate risk for imported product coming into the country. Um, so we're going to unpack each one of these in turn, uh, but just quickly we are identifying import safety risk. We are qualifying that risk or scoping it out. Um, we're targeting shipments coming into the country. Um, we're examining those shipments as they come into U.S. ports of entry. Uh, we're evaluating um, the activity that occurred at that cargo examination. Was it a successful target? Was it an unsuccessful successful target? Um, and then we're reporting out on that. So let's dive right in on our very first step in terms of how we mitigate risk. Yeah, also I'd like to point out uh, from the previous slide, probably the word that stands out the most in everyone's mind when they see that slide is target, because that is actually where uh, your cargo would be stopped uh, based upon the, the diagram that's depicted here. Uh, but with our work with CBP at SeaTac and from CPSC's perspective, the most important word on this slide is at the top and it's in smaller print and it's mitigation because our goal is to, of course, uh, mitigate the risk of uh, the products that are being imported coming in from foreign and uh, that's, of course, the underlying goal of what CPSC is about. We're as much about uh, facilitating legitimate trade as we are about enforcement. So actually what you see here is part of a programmatic cycle that's been developed uh, by SeaTac uh, that works in harmony with CPSC's risk assessment methodology. Uh, but of course this methodology, uh, this uh, cycle that you're looking at on the screen here envelops a broader federal landscape which also includes other government regulations uh, and other participating government agencies, which Ed will talk about in a little bit. Uh, but I just wanted to emphasize that the idea here is to mitigate the risk and not stop cargo. Uh, we don't want to stop cargo unnecessarily. We want to facilitate legitimate trade. Right. Um, so as we dive into our uh, work process, uh, we'll start with identifying risk. What are the triggers uh, that would cause us to classify something as a risk? Um, what comes through at the bottom uh, would cause us to um, want to qualify or scope out a particular risk. So we'll just start from top left to right and down. Um, so lab samples, understanding that each one of those agencies that you all saw uh, on that first slide has domestic authority to test particular products coming into the country. Each one maintains their own laboratory and scientific services, uh, CPSC being, um, yeah, you know, no, no, no uh, difference in that. They, they also maintain their labs. Um, understanding that that laboratory is producing information that is useful for us, not only for targeting purposes, um, so understanding as risk comes out of that from a data perspective, that's important for us to look at, um, but also going in, it helps us to manage our targeting. So seeing where that particular shipment sample is in its life cycle is important to us as we manage the targeting. Um, E-allegations, understanding CBP mains a, maintains a posture uh, with the trade community where we ask for information uh, with regards to trade violations, trade fraud. We receive thousands of those on an annual basis, majority falling with IPR or anti-dumping countervailing duties. Um, I would ask of this audience if there's particular information that you have regarding trade fraud that you would submit that information to CBP. Um, new laws and regulations is something that we pay close attention to, understanding that um, as, as limits go down, our risk level might go up for a particular product all that being dictated by the law or regulations. Um, product recall is understanding that 
Most all regulatory authorities have domestic authority to recall products off store shelves. You also need a buffer to protect for future importations. We're serving in that need from a national basis. Um, port seizures, as we'll see in a few moments, um, there are hundreds and hundreds of ports across the country. Um, CBP is taking a, a layered approach to targeting across the country. So port activity is something that we're watching very closely on a day-to-day -day basis, understanding our charge is to mine the shop nationally. Um, and trade intelligence um, is something that we're going to talk more about in the next slide. So trade intelligence, Jack and I had the opportunity to present uh, this uh, same presentation out in kind of an extended format yesterday. Um, we had confessed that we kind of labored over this slide uh, pre, pre Toy Fair, thinking through what's the message that we really want to get across in this particular talk, understanding this is the audience that we m most want to reach. Um, what we're looking to do is very much engage with TIA uh, and with their membership to better understand how we can shore up enforcement from a targeting perspective. Um, understanding that information um, empowers us to make better decisions. How do we make those better decisions? And I think you all can play a major role in that. Understanding, yes, there's an enforcement benefit, and we could all experience in that benefit, but there's also um, a facilitation benefit that could be um, provided to all. Yeah, as Ed mentioned, we went, uh, we labored at this definition uh, of what we wanted to, the idea we wanted to convey about uh, trade intelligence to you folks. And uh, we started, what well, started off as a paragraph, you know, kind of turned out to be a very short sentence, but actually carries a couple of different ideas here that you would probably want to take away from you. But the main idea, uh, I think the main word from here is information. Uh, because, uh, you know, we look at information as being our most valuable commodity. Um, we were talking at length about that, as Ed mentioned yesterday, to a, to a smaller group, but a little more at, uh, at length. But uh, in the basic sense, you know, targeting is all about information because we take information from, from the, you know, the, the shippers, the, the carriers, you as importers, if you do import your products, and the information that your broker supplies to us, and we compare that information against a variety of data elements, and we are able to make an assessment uh, uh, concerning the risk of any particular commodity that's being brought into the country. Uh, so of course it just stands the reason the more information that we have when a shipment is coming in, when we look at an importation, the better we're able to analyze that information and then make a, an appropriate uh, determination uh, con concerning the uh, potential risk of any given commodity that's coming in. Of course, that would include toys. Uh, but uh, we also want to keep in mind, like I said, we they have a couple of ideas here in this one sentence, this definition, and that is uh, we, we wanted to make sure you understood that the converse is also true, true when it comes to information. It's the lack of information that can also create red flags. Um, when you're looking at it from the, the, the viewpoint of an analyst that's sitting down and reviewing shipment data, uh, missing information, inconsistent information, inaccurate information, all of that creates a doubt in the minds of the analyst. And that could just, uh, you know, result in uh, a, a unnecessary stoppage of a shipment at the port of entry. Mm. And I would definitely point everybody back uh, to your TIA staff. Uh, Rebecca and Al uh, are waiting for emails uh, regarding port stoppages. Uh, we we, we uh, very much want to assist in these conversations. In yesterday's uh, discussion, kind of the reoccurring theme was, what do I do or why was it so? Um, I can't do much about the why was it so, but I think in the future uh, we can start to address um, what can we do moving forward? And I would definitely point you back to Al or Rebecca. Uh, if, you, if you come into instances where you have information uh, regarding a, a manufacturer or a shipper who's producing violative products and you want to share that information, I would point you back to TIA to share that information with us. Um, but if you have information regarding a shipment of yours that's been stopped, again, I would point you back to Rebecca to pass that information along to us that we can serve to assist uh, in expediting that trade. Next slide, please. Um, so now that we've uh, spent a lot of time talking about how we identify risk, um, how would we qualify or scope out what that risk is? Uh, we kind of have two, two different thoughts to think through in terms of scoping. One is the product itself. Um, understanding customs, legacy customs, 
um, Alexander Hamilton, our tradition has been all about the product, providing a proper classification for that product as it's moving into the country for the pur purpose of duty, right? Um, so some of you might be familiar with that big thick book that is the harmonized tariff schedule. Every product has a code with a taxable duty associated. That's how we align from that perspective. Um, but then you have how regulatory authorities are structured from a CFR perspective or from a regulatory statute perspective. How those two things match is something that we've spent a long time thinking about. How product aligns with regulation isn't always a one-to-one, -one, um, which means that you can have multiple agencies looking at your product at importation. Sometimes with those two agencies not knowing that there's an intersect there. Well, that's a huge opportunity for Customs and Border Protection. And that's something that we've thought long and hard about in, the, in terms of how we do targeting, understanding it serves our interests as Customs and Border Protection if we can do the exam once, not twice, not three times, not once at the port, not once at the importer premise, but once, one time, right? How do we help facilitate that? It very much starts in this conversation. Um, so what these interwoven circles represent our agencies and the products that they regulate and where they share, right? I'm not quite sure where that red dot is, if that's a, a toy with meat inside that has wheels. I'm, I'm not sure, but um, that's our dream target, right? So, um, but in terms of helmets, think about helmets as a CPSC regulated product for kids, right? Um, NHTSA, Department of Transportation, would look at it from a, from a motorcycle helmet perspective. But when it's coming into the country, the way that that product's classified, we can't differentiate which one it is, which is really important to us when we start to think about classification. Vehicles is another important area. Understanding EPA has jurisdiction over the engine, the emissions, where Department of Transportation would be looking at that product from airbags, lighting, seat belts, things like that. Um, next slide. So this is, uh, this is Jack and I's territory that we cover. Uh, it's pretty vast. Uh, when you start to think about how trade comes into the country, be it air, rail, sea, truck, um, as, as, as long as that's moving into the country, it's being imported, be it through our international mail facilities or express consignment. We need to have a posture and a strategy for how we address that, um, understanding that that same manufacturer who's servicing a group of importers in Seattle could also be servicing a whole group of importers and consignees in San Juan. So it's very important that the national strategy very much dictate the tone. So now that we've walked through how we would identify risk, how we would scope or qualify that out, uh, let's dive into kind of the meat of what we're talking about here, and that's targeting. Um, so this is how we would prioritize the work that we do um, at the Commercial Targeting and Analysis Center uh, alongside partners such as uh, CPSC. So at the bottom there, you would find where we spend the least amount of time. And as you begin to move up that pyramid, you'll find us spending more and more time focusing in on, really trying to draw out what is high risk, not saying we're not dabbling in the medium risk and we're not spending some time in the low risk, but in terms of prioritizing our day, in terms of the targets that we put forward, this is our list of priorities. Yeah, and as a, as a, uh, a, a member of the CTAC, as far as uh, uh, from the viewpoint of CPSC, uh, of course, there's other products that CPSC regulates and are concerned with, uh, not just toys. Uh, we understand that's the focus today. But uh, just keep in mind that what you're looking at here on this screen is uh, strategies and operations to address uh, all import safety risk for all consumer products on behalf of CPSC. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, this uh, is, uh, is aligned with our risk assessment methodology, or otherwise known as our RAM. Uh, you remember we talked about mitigating risk earlier, that being the underlying goal. So uh, this also harmonizes uh, with the methodology that we, uh, that we have in place, and we've become proactive through targeting models, which are actually shown here. That's what it's depicting, is targeting models that focus on uh, several different issues, uh, but probably the most uh, significant would be uh, the global supply chain, and uh, then, of course, it would be uh, unknown entities, which would be uh, people that we've we've never heard of before, uh, manufacturers, importers that we've just never seen. Uh, so, because these models obviously can be, uh, I guess, 
more aggressive, for lack of a better word, uh, than others. Um, within the framework of our, our methodology, we actually are able to uh, place these uh, programs as it is associated with a certain shipment under a certain risk category or risk level, and that's what's being shown here. So we have, we can rank uh, shipments according to what a shipment is associated with any given program or operation as a high risk, medium risk, or low risk, and of course the eventual goal is to bring everyone into the low risk category. Um, that's, uh, you know, that, that's our goal, and hopefully we'll get there soon. We'll never have a zero risk. That's the, uh, probably the under, underlying theme here, because uh, zero risk just doesn't exist in our world, because um, we're dealing with an imperfect, an imperfect world, so you'll never have zero risk as long as we're living in an imperfect world. But of course, uh, um, hopefully we can reach that low risk status uh, with the efforts that we're with our partners here with CBP. That's great. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so now that we've walked through identifying and qualifying, we've stopped the shipment, now it's sitting at the port, uh, now it's time to deploy resources to that particular freight. Um, to conduct an examination. In this instance, we're talking about CPSC compliance investigators going to ports of entries, uh, many of which they're co-located at, um, understanding that every time we do that, there are costs associated. Costs to the trade industry, costs to federal government. We need to be very wise in the shipments that we stop. Um, what we see here along the bottom kind of um, traces um, our history as targeters, um, where we start to, to gauge from 2011, which is kind of when we kicked off this, this commercial targeting in Alice Center, through current date, the, the projected number of shipments that on a month-to-month -month basis we're looking, looking at stopping, um, understanding um, in the beginning, you know, if this is your, if this is your um, IRA uh, um, retirement account, you're worried, right? So you, tr you want to try to avoid those peaks and troughs. Um, what we're talking about for um, moving forward is very much flatlining that to the, to the extent that we can, understanding we want to be trying to push a reoccurring workload to ports of entries, understanding we're trying to drive compliance into an industry through targeting, um, we're looking at particular entities, not necessarily at meeting a quota. That's very important. The word random came up in yesterday's discussion. I think it's important to just drive home nothing that we do at the Commercial Targeting Analysis Center with Consumer Product Safety Commission is random. Um, next slide. Um, so data, as we discussed, information becomes very important. Um, what's depicted here and some of these acronyms and systems may look foreign to you. Um, each agency works kind of insulated in its own stovepipe, right? I think we can assume everybody knows that. Um, how we bring those information sets together becomes incredibly important in terms of how we manage the work we do and identify risk. Um, so what we're looking at here is um, all systems coming together for the sole purpose of managing the targeting through the Commercial Targeting and Analysis Center. You'll notice here uh, CPSC systems are listed. Those systems are coming in to CBP systems and we're looking at that data, making targeting decisions regarding mitigating risk or continuing on with targeting. Uh, next slide, please. This brings to a close that six-step mitigation process. So now that we have um, identified the risk, we've scoped it out, we've qualified that it is a risk, we've stopped cargo at U.S. ports of entries, we've conducted e examinations, we've evaluated that through the mashing up of information, data, cargo examination remarks, um, laboratory findings, seizure analysis. We've brought all that together to make a decision, and now it's time to report out. Um, we see reporting in kind of two streams, what we do as government to inform one another. So that's stats, that's how well we did from a discrepancy rate perspective, that's what was the details of the seizure, do we need to walk that back, does there need to be an investigation, that's kind of internal reporting, and then the external stuff. So the video that we watched at the beginning, I would kind of associate that with external reporting. So in that instance, we had 10 shipments coming into eight U.S. ports of entry, all being seized for the same reason associated to the same entities. Um, what were we to do with that information? So again, a wonderful opportunity to notify the public, also partnering up with Ed, um, TIA, 
um, CPSC and getting that out, understanding it's a much more powerful message when we're approaching it from three different perspectives and we're all pushing at the same time. And just part of the external uh, that's shown here on the slide, I just wanted to make everyone aware, like I did to our group yesterday, that CPSC on our public website actually lists, uh, actually has a press release, as it's called, an import stoppage report. Uh, and of course, this report shows all of the, all of the consumer products that have been seized on behalf of CPSC at the ports of entry across the country. Um, it's a good idea to be aware of that report if you're an importer. Uh, first of all, uh, if you are an importer, uh, I would think you wouldn't want to find your name on the report because it does list the importer's name, the manufacturer's name, the product, uh, the lot size, and what the violation was. And I believe it also has the country of origin on there too. Uh, but uh, you can also use it as a resource. Uh, if uh, you are an importer and you plan on, if you're doing business with one of the manufacturers that's listed there, or you plan on doing business with one of the manufacturers that's on the report, uh, you may want to ask a few more questions or put a few more controls in place to ensure that what they're sending you is a compliant product. So the message there would be, uh, you, you want to use that manufacturer, well, you know, buyer beware. Um, the next two slides uh, talk about two different things. Um, as was mentioned in the very beginning, Centers of Excellence and Expertise is something that CBP is doing to reorganize the way it looks at trade. Um, I'm assigned to our Atlanta office, which focuses on consumer products, uh, understanding we're trying to do much closer collaboration with industry with regards to not only enforcement, but primarily how trade is processed. Um, so as you'll see here in this slide, what we've depicted is the CTAC being at the heart of how we're going to move out enforcement for these various centers of excellence and expertise, understanding that the regulatory agencies associated could span multiple centers of excellence and expertise. Next slide. Um, so this is looking out. Um, we have engaged several foreign countries, uh, starting with the customs authorities. And, and the discussion usually goes something like this. H how are you currently working with regulatory agencies to address import safety risk for their jurisdictional authorities? Um, some responses uh, are great, some are kind of silent, some, but all have come back looking at the CTAC as a model for um, expanding on their internal relationships and how they bring regulatory agencies um, into those discussions to understand their customs authorities across the world, um, how well those regulatory agencies are engaging with those customs authorities. So currently we're talking with several countries such as France, Germany, United Kingdom, um, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, um, talking through this issue. Um, if you're Nation X, what, what does that look like for you from a regulatory perspective? Um, so in Canada, for instance, we see CBSA, which is CBP's counterpart in Canada, how well they're working with Health Canada matters to us. Uh, understanding that the violations we're seeing in Long Beach likely are playing out in Prince Rupert, Vancouver, places like that. So how well we can share information government to government is going to become critically important to us moving forward. Um, that concludes um, our, our slides, and I believe Jack had some additional information that he wanted to share. Uh, I believe there may be one more slide here that we can just show very quickly here uh, at the very end. Just, just, uh, we just wanted to bring this to your attention. We shared this with a group yesterday. It was a much smaller group, but I believe it was uh, probably more in tune to what they wanted to know. And uh, of course, with the audience we have here, this may not be a particular interest to you, but I just wanted to be aware that we did share that with them because when it comes to importing anything, uh, there's some pitfalls that you know could be avoided. Uh, that would mean delay of your cargo at the port of entry, and it would apply to anything, but I tried to tailor this list uh, for toys, you know. So if you're an importer of toys, this particular list uh, would be interesting to you. Um, you just want to keep these particular recommendations uh, in mind, these bullet points, and uh, perhaps, uh, you know, share this. If you use a, if you, if you sell file, that's great. If you use a broker, you may want to share this information with your broker. Uh, but I believe all the years that I've spent in processing cargo, uh, you know, uh, with, with Customs Border Protection, I work with them, and also, uh, you know, the work that I'm doing now as an international trade specialist, CPSC, uh, 
these are probably the, 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 the highlights here. These are the things that, I, that I've always seen that causes a delay of uh, cargo when it, when it arrives at the port of entry. Uh, the, I believe the last part there, I just want to make this one more point uh, since, we are, since we are here at the invitation of the Toy Industry Association. Uh, you know, of course, you can sign up for these trusted trader programs that's a part of ISA. Uh, that's the uh, Importer Self Assessment and the uh, uh, Importer Self Assessment Product Safety, which are is a pilot program uh, that would give you a protected status. Uh, it can be a bit difficult, a bit uh, to to become uh, um, uh, be accepted under those uh, particular programs we have. And so, if you're a smaller importer, uh, you know, a smaller business, uh, since the TIA has now actually set up a has a dialogue with Customs and Border Protection. Well, if I'm a small business importer of toys, I would certainly want to take advantage of that. You know, so now you have a you have a, a a way of actually communicating with CBP at the highest level in Washington D.C. when it comes to an importation that you're concerned about, and of course that would be through uh, Rebecca, I believe. Correct? Yeah. yeah. So with that, we'll close out. Uh, again, I just want to say thank you so much to Al. Uh, and Rebecca and Ed uh, and Stacy and others at TIA who have really um, come up alongside CBP uh, in, in desire to support better this CPSC mission. Um, I'm looking forward to maybe talking with a few folks um, afterwards. Um, if we have t time, um, Al or Rebecca, be, be happy to answer questions. I know we're running up against lunch perhaps, but again, just want to say thank you to everybody for your attentiveness uh, this morning. and. Uh, Really appreciate the opportunity to address you today. Thank you. Uh, Ed and Jack, thank you very much. It was very, very informative. Um, actually, I'll start it off with one question that I had, which is: I think you've been uh, you've you've presented some uh, tremendously valuable information here in terms of how you can avoid having your product targeted. Um, I, I guess my question would be: once an importer has had a shipment or two targeted, what steps can they take to kind of get them off the list, assuming that the product is, is compliant? Uh, okay, we're, we're assuming that your, your, your shipment was stopped and it was examined and then there was, uh, there was no compliance issue, there was no admissibility issue, correct? Correct, yes. In other yeah, words, yeah, and, how, yeah, and it, how to avoid that happening again. Uh, I would say that if you're really concerned, if, if you see a pattern, uh, that's, that's the key here. If you see a pattern of your shipments that are being stopped at a port of entry and you know that you, you, you understand that there's a CPSC issue, uh, that's where you can actually go two ways. You can obviously you have a dialogue through the TIA with the Office of Compliance at, uh, at CPSC, but you also have a dialogue now with Customs Border Protection through Rebecca. So if you're a TIA member, you could take advantage of that. And uh, we would certainly open, uh, open that. We would be transparent and let you know what the issue is from CPSC's perspective. We, we would definitely let you know what, what is happening there and give you the necessary information you would need in order to resolve the issue so that you, we're not, we could end that pattern of stoppage of your cargo, if possible. And, and, if I, and if I might add, just, just from a CBP perspective, understanding um, a lot of trade gets stopped on an annual basis, maybe even for toys, that is not CPSC related. Right. Um, so in, the, in those instances, I think it's important to know that you have advocates here on, here on stage um, who will look into those issues. And we might not be able to share with you as to why the particular shipment was stopped. But I guess just know that we'll be working on your behalf to try and see if we can expedite that um, or come to a conclusion. If, 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 it is, if it is random and there's no pattern, um, how we could try and minimize that moving forward. Yeah, that, that actually that question came up yesterday. Ed's making a good point because uh, the, you wouldn't want to make the mistake that if something, if a, a toy shipment that you were importing was stopped for examination by CBP at the port, don't automatically assume there was a CPSC issue right. involved. Right. Great. Thank you. Other questions? We've got one in the back. Hi, thank you. Is there um, a possibility, uh, we understand that, that 
from time to time shipments may get stopped and, and examined. But is there a way to implement a time frame, a turnaround time, so as our retailers downstream don't, um, we don't miss shipments to them based on a, a shipment that's held? So is there a way, again, to implement a, a maximum time, turnaround time for these shipments? Okay, well, first let me just say that if your shipment is stopped for examination by CBP, uh, there is a time frame that's actually it's written in a regulation. So they, they, have to, they have to process your shipment within, uh, uh, within a certain number of days of the stoppage of the shipment. So there is a, a regulatory uh, issue involved there. Now, if, if there's a problem found in your shipment, I think that's where we probably get into the, you know, the nuances of okay, the time issue that you're talking about. And uh, that can be a bit complicated. I can say this, though, that if your shipment is stopped for CPSC purposes and there is a CPSC issue, in other words, concern uh, as to admissibility of the product because of a CPSC rule or regulation, uh, you would be notified very promptly in writing yourself, uh, perhaps through your broker, if you're using a broker, but you would be notified very promptly that of what the that, that it was stopped by CPSC. That there is a CPSC issue, uh, we have a formality. It's called the um, notice of uh, uh, notice of detention and notice of sampling, and also a notice of condition sampling conditional release if it's released to you. And it's uh, very explicit in detail as to what's happening there, what we're looking for. You also have a point of contact on that form, so you'd have a CPSC person to call through email or a phone call to see what you can be done to resolve the issue. If it's not, if it's not CPSC, what is the turnaround time? What, what? If it's not CPSC, what is the turnaround time for CBP? Well, it's five business days from the day that, that's the regulation. And so if, if your shipment stopped and uh, what it, it's five business days from the day of presentation, what that means is depending on how your cargo comes in, whether it's ocean, air, rail, it, it depends on what that, uh, pre that presentation date is. But let's assume, let's just say it's an ocean shipment. It arrives at the port, it's moved to a, a container station, it's unloaded from the container. Once it's in a, in a position to be examined, by CBP, that's when the clock starts. They have five business days to make a determination concerning your cargo, what they're going to do with it. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Um, I had an instance a couple years ago where I was bringing in an LTL shipment, and it was for someone, and it was greeting cards. It was, com you know, the inks were completely compliant. We had all of the certification, and there was a time frame on the shipment when it needed to be here. And we were notified that the container was seized, and it was held, and then it was x-rayed, and it had nothing to do with our shipment, and it took us about three weeks to get the shipment released because who, you know, the uh, port authority who, took, who seized the container took their time to x-ray it and then they took their time to get into the container and get the compliant products out of it. And what can you do in a situation like that? Well, those, those are unfortunate situations and if you don't understand what she was talking about when she said a LCL, that's talking about that's less than container load. So that means that your, your, your shipment is consolidated and it's uh, in a container with multiple consignees, maybe one other consignee or it could be up to, I've seen 20, 30 consignees products in one container. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I kind of look at it like, uh, uh, and this is from a C CBP standpoint, that's the only way I can address this part is if CBP recognizes that there an issue that calls for an x-ray Normally, it's uh, a higher priority. Something, there, there's something going on with that shipment that caused th them to send up a red flag saying that there, there's probably a security issue that they're looking at. And it might not have anything at all to do, to do with you as an importer, your product, but with the other consignee and their product. And it could be part of the supply chain 
thing that they're looking at too because CBP is also very concerned about the global supply chain uh, when it comes to importations, especially with ocean cargo. So there is that, uh, there is that issue you're going to run into from time to time. And unfortunately, uh, if, if it's something like that, there's not a whole lot you can do except to just try to keep that dialogue open with the port to see if you can get your product released as soon as possible. Any other questions? Okay. Oh. Uh, uh, why is it that uh, Customs and Border Patrol is insistent um, on using their own laboratories uh, to ensure that uh, product is compliant as opposed to um, utilizing uh, CPSC approved laboratories here in the States? which could turn around results in as little as 24 hours? Um, me address that? You, you can try. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, that's, I, hear, I hear what you're saying, and uh, I'm, uh, honestly, I'm not the, uh, um, I'm not the expert uh, on behalf of CPSC to really address that issue. Um, you know, we have our compliance staff. We, I think we even have some, uh, we have a lab personnel here that was, uh, um, I don't know if it's in the audience that could talk about that. Mr. Aragon could address, could have addressed that too a bit. But um, that's a bit out of scope for me as an international trade specialist. Um, once, once your shipment is stopped, you know, once I target it and say, I think we have a problem here and that's the reason we stopped it, you know, my job is pretty much finished. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, perhaps that's something that we can uh, we can talk with some other CPSC people about. Do you have another perspective? Right. On that? I, I would just add that um, CBP should not be independently leveraging its labs uh, to do CPSC confirmatory testing unless CPSC specifically requested for that work to be done. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's something that we can take offline. Uh, we can have some discussions with others at the, uh, at the CPSC, because I, I do know that other agencies do allow private laboratory results, uh, because often you can pay a premium to a private lab and get the results much more quickly than you can get it through the, the agency's own laboratories. Right. So yeah. yeah. I know that's something that's been discussed, too, uh, with uh, you know, members of our agency, staff of the agency. So I know they have, they have looked at that, you know, that issue in the past. Uh, honestly, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure where that's where that's going, or if they're still, you know, considering doing something about that too. Yeah. So um, we'll see. I was just going to say, TIA will have some conversations with the agency, and and if we have something to report, we'll we'll uh, certainly let the trade know. So uh, if that is it, I think we'll uh, just uh, thank uh, Jack and Ed again, and and we really appreciate uh, you coming. Thanks, thank you. Everybody. Thank you. I just want to reiterate our thank you to Ed Ryan and Jack McDaniel of CBP and CPSC, respectively, for helping us understand that process at the ports, as well as the mitigation process that they talked about, and especially those tips on avoiding some of those pitfalls. Um, they've both been very open to working with TIA. And so, you know, as Al just said, if you do have questions, um, we're happy to field those for you. Which also brings me back to the question posed by one of our audience members in, in the last topic, and I want to just respond a little bit to that um, and to others who may have similar questions or issues as they struggle to comply with these CPSC regs. TIA would like to hear from you. We are frequently asked by CPSC for the input and the perspective of small companies they want such examples. So I encourage you to reach out to CPSC if you feel comfortable. If not, feel free to come to TIA and we can help um, bridge that and represent your, your perspective and the struggles that you're, you're seeing. They really want to hear from those who are really feeling the effects of the regulations. Perhaps TIA can help add volume to your, to your concerns with the agency. Um, and so, actually, I want to do a little survey before we jump into the next topic. I see so many people, first of all, here. I see so many new faces, but I also see a lot of faces that I see every year on this day. So I want to do a really fast survey. Um, how many people here are first timers to our annual toy safety seminar that we do at Toy Fair each year? OK, look, we've got a lot of new new first timers, so I want to welcome you guys. Thank you for coming, and I hope it's been informative for you. 
Um, how many people are one to five years um, attending this program? Hmm, probably a comparable number to the first timers. Um, do we have some six to tens? A little smaller group, but, but strong, strong in years. And then what about uh, 11 to 19? Ah, we got an, an, um, about 10. Okay, what about the 20 pluses? I know you're out there, I've seen you. Nobody? Come on, I'm not the only one. I know you're out there. Okay, I see Nancy and uh, Rachel. Al, I, uh, where are you? Eric, I thought for sure you were a 20 plus. And Fred too. Um, I think some of you are lying and about your ages and about your number of years here, but we'll, go, we'll just skip past that. Okay, so we're going to switch gears a, a little bit for our last session. We've heard from some government experts, some government officials. Now we're going to hear the industry perspective. So it's my privilege I get to introduce my colleague, Al Kaufman. He is our Senior Vice President of Technical Affairs for TIA. And he's a toy industry veteran with more than 35 years of experience addressing product safety, quality, assurance, regulatory compliance, and products testing issues for toy companies and retailers. He was also one of those hands, I think, in the 20 plus category of sitting in this room. Prior to joining TIA in May of 2011, Al was Vice President for Global Product Safety and Regulatory Affairs at Toys R Us. Previously, he spent more than a decade directing production, sourcing, and technical services with the Walt Disney Company and its affiliated companies. And earlier in his career, he, he held technical and production positions at a number of toy manufacturers, including Mattel, Knickerbocker, and Coleco. As a graduate of UCLA with a degree in biology and organic chemistry, I can attest he is a real fun guy to hang out with. Uh, but w combined with his industry experience, he is a tremendous resource for TIA and its members, and that's my honest opinion. As I've learned in the 15 years that I've known Al, he is always generous with his knowledge, and today is no exception. So please join me in welcoming Al Kaufman. He's going to talk about... And Dale's going to provide our technical update today, talking about changes to the ASTM F963 standard that are anticipated and some of the European Union requirements. Oh, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Joan. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit today, and, and I know we're running a little behind on time, so I'm going to, um, I was going to review some of the changes that occurred to ASTM F963.11. Um, so I'll go through those very quickly, but certainly if anybody has any questions, we'll be, we'll be available to answer those either um, immediately after I uh, finish speaking or uh, later on through the day. And, and uh, TIA, uh, both Joan, myself, the, the Washington office, we're, we're all here to function as resources for, uh, for our membership and for the industry, so please feel free to, to reach out if you have those, those issues. Uh, we're going to first talk about ASTM F963. Uh, very quickly, um, uh, due to the time constraints, we're going to uh, talk about it, the Dash 11 version of the standard was published in December 2011. The CPSC endorsed it by unanimous vote uh, in March of 2012, and it became mandatory as a federal rule in June of 2012. Um, Third-party testing and certification is now required for products that are within the scope of that standard. Uh, the, the changes, very briefly, the biggest change was the heavy metals requirements. Uh, the addition of uh, requirements for heavy metals in substrates um, as opposed to uh, the previous requirement which applied only to surface coatings. Uh, there was also a, a total screen process that was allowed and, uh, and a compositing procedure. Uh, we added design guidelines for bath toy projections. Uh, we clarified some of the requirements for toys with spherical or nearly spherical ends. Uh, plastic film, we clarified that it applied to all films, not just packaging film. Uh, and you can see a variety of, uh, of other changes that were, uh, that were made to the standard. Uh, heavy metals, as I said, this was the, the biggest change. Uh, we updated it to add the CPSIA 90 part per million total lead 
a requirement for surface coatings and 100 parts per million for substrates. Uh, we extended the soluble element limitations to substrates, as I said. Uh, we added the total screen option. Uh, we added test methods for, for substrate testing. And we added, um, in discussions with the CPSC staff, there was a, a real concern about cadmium in plated metal components, particularly those that were small enough to be um, swallowed. And, and so we added a special 24-hour cadmium extraction test for, for those types of items. Uh, we, um, it, it, we think it contains the most um, comprehensive toy safety standard worldwide. Uh, I think some of you are aware of the fact that, that uh, EN71 has now diverged from ASTM F963, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and um, it was aligned with EN71 prior to this latest change and ISO 8124, except for that uh, CPSIA uh, total lead requirement and that 24-hour cadmium extraction for metallic small parts. Um, you've all seen these charts, I'm sure. They've been in the standard for many years for surface coatings. Uh, they also, uh, the, the table one applies also to substrates with the exception of modeling clays that are, um, that are part of a toy. Uh, rem just to remind you, modeling clays sold by themselves typically are not toys. They're typically art materials, but if they're included in a toy, then they're subject to the requirements of F963. Um, paper and paperboard uh, are not tested under the standard because we simply weren't, uh, weren't finding uh, an issue with them. Uh, fabrics and other materials that are exempted by 16 CFR 1500.87 by the CPSC for total lead, uh, we've also extended that to soluble lead, but it is not at this point extended to, to other, uh, the other soluble elements. Uh, compositing isn't allowed for soluble testing, but it is allowed for the, the total screen test. Um, surface coating limitations generally apply up to age 14, and the substrate requirements generally apply up to age 6 with some specified um, um, special cases. For instance, items that are intended to be mouthed, um, items, you know, for instance, if you had a toy saxophone, uh, that would be an example of something that even if the age grade were over 6, you would still need to apply those substrate requirements. Uh, same thing for items that are intended to store food or drink, writing instruments, and, uh, and, it's, and cosmetics. Uh, future F963 revisions, there are a number of, of changes afoot. This is a very active subcommittee. Uh, first of all, the, the, the magnets, there is a possibility of additional labeling and other miscellaneous changes. Uh, there were some negatives, and it's, uh, it's going to be reballoted within the, uh, the sub F1522 subcommittee and the F15 committee uh, very shortly. Projectiles, um, it's to be balloted, but there's a, a proposal to, a, to add uh, kinetic energy density limitation for the first time, and other miscellaneous changes. So that'll be coming through on your ballots. For those, those of you who are members of ASTM, you'll be seeing those on the ballot pretty shortly. Uh, microbiological safety, um, we did clarify the requirements. Uh, we extended it to um, feathers uh, beyond the, the, uh, the current uh, liquids, paste, putties, powders, gels, et cetera, uh, that were subject to the requirement. And uh, we, we think it, it's much clearer and much easier to follow because we, we set specified limits for plate counts. We also put in place uh, alternative methods. You can now use CTFA methods uh, in addition to the, the specified um, USP methods that were in the standard before. And um, you also have a, an evaluation procedure to determine exactly when a microbial challenge or a USP 51 uh, test is required. Uh, stuffing cleanliness. Um, the test method has been simplified. I think that's ready for publication, uh, as is the microbial safety uh, requirement. Uh, coin and button cell batteries, the working group is still uh, wrestling with possible additional labeling because of the hazard involved with, the special hazard involved with those batteries. Uh, heavy elements, there are going to be some changes. The only real substantive change is to add uh, what's known uh, as HDXRF uh, for a total screen in some limited materials, in, in homogeneous polymers, um, and also in uh, siliceous materials like glass and ceramic. But uh, other than that, there are a number of clarifying changes just to make uh, some of the, 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 to address some of the questions that have come up since Dash 11 uh, to make it absolutely clear what the original intent was. Uh, expanding toys, that's currently in the working group. We're working on coming up with a standard. There is a standard in the EN and ISO standards uh, currently. Uh, we looked at that, uh, determined that while um, 
it uh, would have provided some protection. It also would have eliminated a lot of products which have not been associated with any incidents. So we were, we decided that we were we needed to look a little further in terms of coming up with an effective standard. So uh, that probably won't make the next revision, but uh, we're still working on that. Uh, miscellaneous changes. There's a strap exemption for ride-on toys. For instance, if you have a safety strap or a safety belt on a ride-on toy, it's uh, exempt from the, the length requirement. Um, Push-pull toy definition was put in the, the standard for the first time because it was used in, in several of the, the requirements, particularly acoustics. Um, non-powered scooter exclusion, we added that specifically. In other words, there's already an ASTM standard for non-powered scooters, F2264. And uh, what we did was make it clear that uh, those items are outside the scope of F963. Okay, the European Union, and this is where it gets very interesting. Um, there's a new version of EN 71-1, 2011 plus A2 in 2013. Uh, what it does is change the acoustics requirements uh, to impulse and continuous sound. And there's an addition of what are considered to be exposure categories based on uh, how much um, the child will play with the toy during, during the course of a day. Um, it's fairly complex and it is now out of alignment with the ASTM F963 standard. Uh, EN 71-3, there's a 2013 revision. This is probably the, the, the one that has caused the most heartburn in the industry. Uh, it um, uh, expanded the, the previous list of eight heavy metals to 19, uh, including some that, that, to our knowledge, haven't been associated with, with any incidents or with, with any real toxic hazard like aluminum. Um, but it, it is now required that you, uh, uh, that you determine that, that products meet the uh, migration limits for those, uh, those 19 elements. And it also added three categories of, of material uh, with different limits for each. Um, to make things even more complicated, uh, Germany is applying different limits for lead, arsenic, uh, antimony, mercury, and barium. Um, they, frankly, um, the, the European Commission basically told them no. Uh, Germany sued. Uh, the European Court of Justice has at least preliminarily uh, decided that Germany can continue to apply those separate limits while the, while the case proceeds to its conclusion. So uh, on that one, unfortunately, it's going to be film at 11, but it's going to take a while to wind its way through the court system there. Uh, EN 71-5 for chemical toys other than experimental sets. There's a labeling change to um, align with the, the European Union CLP. Uh, classification, labeling, and packaging of, of chemical materials, uh, which is really the European version of GHS, the globally harmonized system for labeling of chemicals. Um, and then EN 71-12, a, it's a new standard uh, for N uh, nitrosamines and nitros nitrosatable substances. Uh, it adds limits for those substances um, for the first time. Uh, generally, you're only going to see these in things like vulcanized rubber. Um, or where you have a, um, an amine in, in contact with um, a, a substance which can be nitrosated. Uh, that that's, has happened um, in, in the case of, let's say, diethanolamine, where you, where you end up with, uh, in the presence of a nitrosating agent, you end up uh, where that, that actually in the product uh, becomes a nitrosamine. That's very rare in toys. That's typically a cosmetic industry issue. Um, you're, you're typically only going to have to worry about it in, in rubber materials. So, next. Future requirements. Uh, polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons. This is a, a real mouthful, PAHs. Uh, these are complex organic substances that are typically generated by combustion of hydrocarbons. Uh, the major source actually is diesel exhaust. However, you do find it uh, to a certain extent in toys, primarily in carbon black pigments. So if you're using carbon black uh, as a pigment, there is a possibility, depending on what grade you're using, that it could be contaminated with PAHs. Uh, you will, in the future, have to meet this requirement. Um, the um, the, the, occasionally in extender oils, there may be some contamination with PAHs, but, but our experience has been that it's typically going to be in carbon black. Uh, keep in mind that if you do decide to switch to another pigment and you're, and you're making an outdoor product, uh, you may have to be uh, take into account the fact that, that carbon black is, pro is providing a lot of protection from ultraviolet light degradation. So you'll need to take that into account if you start to reformulate. 
Bisphenol A, I think most of you are aware that there's already a migration limit that's within EN 71-9. Um, that's likely to be added to the TSD at some point to make sure that uh, that specific limit applies and not the general limit for um, CM, uh, CMRs, which are uh, carcinogens, mutagens, and, and reprotoxic substances. Uh, other organic compounds and CMRs may be proposed for addition to EN 71-9. Uh, the, the uh, European Union seems to be very, very focused on the chemical area uh, when it comes to toy safety, uh, despite the fact that toys are not typically a, a major source of exposure to these things, uh, to these compounds. So that's essentially it. Yep. And that looks like we managed to, to end almost on time. <laughs> so.